Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fiza Rizvi. I'm 21 years old and I'm studying anthropology at university, which is the study of human culture. Um, I was born and raised in London and we have uh, gone to uh, Hosseinia in um, Hounslow. And from a very young age, we were always listening to Urdu Majalis um, and it never really made, it never really clicked with me. I wasn't very strong in my Urdu language in itself. So for me to understand what Majalis was or what Azadari was or what um, what the story of Garbala was in itself, um, it it only actually clicked with me over the last few years when um, English speakers became a lot more prominent across London, across the West. And it's really helped me build my knowledge, build my connection towards our, our Ahl al-Bayt. We're very lucky to have so many speakers, so many processions uh, like the Arbain procession in London, so many um, different groups like, like charities or like TV production houses as well to keep building our knowledge, to keep showing us what happens in Garbala or what has taken place in Garbala, to see where it all began. Um, when I was growing up and I started to learn about the story of Garbala, um, you know, you always picture it as a storybook. You know, you see it, as, you know, in the way that you read your Disney fairy tales. It kind of was like that for me as a child. Um, but I was blessed to go to Garbala for the first time, to go to Iraq and visit those holy cities for the first time when I was uh, 20, so just last year in February. And that was the first time it actually hit me where all of those, all of those ma martyrs, Hazrat Yakbar Islam, Hazrat Yaskar, Imam Hussein Islam himself, when you go to do your first ziyarat that has the bus and ask for permission to go and complete your ziyarat. All of those stories that you hear at Masayib time or within Nohas or within, um, within your discussion groups on, you know, throughout the year of what we are as Shias or what the Ahl Bayt was and what they stood for, it all comes true. And we see that these weren't just stories, these were people, they, were, uh, they, they are what create us today as people, as individuals. We are we are practicing Shia Islam because of them and because of what they stood for. Um, so I don't think it, I don't think I properly built or established a connection or a, a reality to what Shia Islam was until I went for Ziyarat the first time. And um, I went with a very small group with my uncle, my auntie, my cousins, uh, my grandfather. And that actually, so I had just come back from my brother's wedding, literally a month before that. and. My ziyarat plan happened within two days. My auntie said that she was going to, to Iraq for ziyarat and they needed one more person for the gafala to become five people so you can, uh, I think, verify the visa process or something like that. Um, so she was thinking of, she was trying to find one extra person and I was like, I, you know, university is not too busy right now. It's only 10 days. I've never been before. So many of my friends have gone. So many of my family members have gone. I've seen pictures of it. I've seen the, the beauty of it. And I've, you know, I've learned a lot in these, you know, 19, 20 years of my life. Let's, let's go and see it. Let's go and experience what that beauty is, what that glory is that everyone in my family and my friend circle talk about. Um, so my visa came on the Friday and we left on the Saturday. And within two days, I, uh, within two days of thinking of, oh, I might actually be going, I was now in the city of the holy city of Najaf. We landed, and I remember salawats just going on in the plane, and everyone was. I, I, I know that so many people have gone before, but when you land and when you know that you're now with Hazrat Ali, you know you're with Amir al-Mu'minin, and you can't explain that feeling. You can't. You can't express that in a way that does it justice. Um, so yeah, we, we landed in Najaf. Uh, we then went straight to Garbala, straight to Garbala to do our ziyarat with Hazrat Abbas and Imam Hussain al-Islam. We saw the maqams. Um, I think every maqam has, it, has its own, has its own 
uh, aura, I guess. Um, De La Zainabia and the Khaimah, the campsites, um, those two were the ones that really, really um, hit me. Um, and I felt very strongly towards those. I think I spent a good five or six hours in the campsites um, just because that's where all, that's where everyone watched from. That's where Bibi Skina herself was trying to stop her father from leaving. That was where Hastariyasko was brought back to the campsites after he was killed. And there, there are so many, every story that we hear in Messiah starts from that one area. So the campsites were actually the, the strongest place that I felt at, um, where I knew that this is where everything started from, this is where everything finished from, this is what was burnt, this was what, this is where Hasdariyasko was supposed to be buried, this is where everything had started from. And my connection to the campsites um, became very strong. So when uh, I was there for my ziyarat um, to Hasdabas, um, I made a, very strong, strong wish that I'd come back as soon as possible um, to visit them again. And um, we get back to London, we are talking about our ziyarat, and within a week or within two weeks, uh, my uncle then tells, tells us all that, oh, we're planning to go for Irwain now. So I speak to my mother, I speak to a few of my cousins, I speak to a few of my other family friends, and a lot of people in our, our group, in our social circle, are all now ready to come and everyone's now preparing and we book our tickets and I think as much as preparation as much preparation as you can do I'd say do it spiritually not physically if that makes sense um, so we took a lot of food and we took a lot of snacks which were great for when we were in Najaf and Kufa and in Ghazmen but for the walk the walk itself was um, incredible Incredible. Um, as soon as you start from Najaf, as soon as you leave your hotel from Najaf, you are being showered with um, not, even, not only adults that are serving food and making food, there are children, there are elderly, there are disabled people as well that are serving, that are making food for you, that are cleaning up the tents, that are uh, cleaning the toilets. It's inexplainable how much, um, how much hospitality you get to see out there throughout, throughout, not only throughout the walk, but throughout Ziyarat itself at Arbaeen time. Um, we had a five meter pole that had the flag of Yasajad written in English. Um, uh, it was a green flag and I'm not sure if anyone who was on Arbaeen last year saw the flag, but um, many, many people came and took the flag while we were walking and wanted to take pictures with it because it was Everyone that had alams or had flags, they were in Arabic. And I think this was probably one of the very few flags that was so huge and so massive that were written in English. Um, and it, it, was, it was great. Um, there were about 34 of us at the end of um, the planning. There were 34 of us, family and friends, um, that went for Arbain last year. We had a hotel very close to uh, Imam Ali's harem in Najaf, alhamdulillah, we had a hotel very close to um, the 7th and the 9th Imam's Shrine in Ghazmen and in, um, and in Garbala, it was our hotel was very close to Hazrat Abbas's shrine as well. So we were very, very lucky in that sense to be just a one or two minute walk away from going to do our daily namazes, going to recite ziyarat, going to even just sit there in awe of, you, of the magnificence of what you're seeing, the lights, the chandeliers, the mirrors, the carpets, the every single part of it, it's so clean and you're, you're so well kept there. No one wants to, you know, you see so many people struggling. You see little children that may be disabled. You see elderly with their walking sticks or their, their frames that they're trying to make their way to say their salams and pay their respects and build that connection for themselves and you don't realize within such a small city where you have 25 million people at Arbain time, more than that most probably, um, that are going in and out of the shrine. So we started the walk um, on a Thursday 
and we got to Gervala by Saturday afternoon, I think. So I arrived in the, in the hotel on my own. Um, I met my mother there, I met my cousins there, and then my, my two aunties, they came about half an hour, an hour afterwards, and we were both crying because we thought we'd lost each other. And it was just very overwhelming, very overwhelming. Um, from the walk as well, when we got to Gervala, when you're walking, um, you kind of start to see this glimmer around like in the distance and you're like what what is that shining and you, you know in your heart but then you're kind of not accepting that that is Hazrat Abbas's Rosa and because I've seen it before I was I was only there a few months before but now I'm there for Arbaeen now I'm there for the most important day of Shia Islam so when I saw Hazrat Abbas's Rosa for the first time it it then gets into your head that you're now there for Arbaeen the most tragically beautiful day of Shia Islam and you're kind of walking towards it and you're I, I so for me I, I closed my eyes my aunties they both kind of kept on walking one of my aunties as well we closed our eyes and we just carried on walking because we didn't want to see it totally there until we could really see it when you're at like pull 1400 ish not even that maybe a bit closer then you can see the dome in all its great glory um, so we closed our eyes up until the end, not even the end, just a bit closer to, to the shrine. And when we opened our eyes, we both just started crying. So, so, not, not crying, but there were just tears and you don't understand the tears, but then you also feel the, the great power that kind of overcomes your heart, it overcomes your mind. And you're just thinking, I'm in front of the, one of the greatest warriors after Imam Ali alayhi salam, and you're standing with the brother of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and you're you're in front of him and you're in front of this land where every story that you've grown up hearing has taken place and it's taken place on these days 1439 years ago it's inexplainable and I'd say for anyone that wants to go for Arbaeen definitely go for definitely go for Ziyar but going for Arbaeen is a totally different experience. I'm lucky enough to be going this year again, inshallah. Um, and I'll be, this year, my purpose will be a little bit different. It'll be a bit more on the academic side of things because I'll be trying to build um, observational analyses for my, for my dissertation. Um, but at the same time, it'll be more about finding other people's experiences and understanding what their way of doing matam or what their way of offering food or what their way of you know not sleeping on a mattress but sleeping on the floor or just their way of mourning their way of commemorating the day of our brain or the the months of Muharram and Safar what it means to them and what it means to their their culture and their background. So when we were in Karbala, we had a hotel very close to the Haram um, and we got to go to the rooftop of our hotel and see both Hazrat Abbas's Rosa and Imam Hussain Islam's Rosa in front of us in very close proximities. Uh, we got to recite Ziyar Darbain there on the day of Arbain. We got to do our daily namaz there as well. Obviously at the time of Arbain, there are millions of people in a very small city um, and it's very well, maintain, well maintained, um, very clean, and everyone's very hospi hospitable. Being on the top of the hotel rooftops and overviewing the view of their domes was also a way, uh, was also a beautiful way of um, paying our respects and doing our ziyara and reciting our namaz. That was one thing um, that I truly. Uh, hold very close to my heart that we had a beautiful view from the hotel. Um, on the day of Arbaeen it's very busy there are processions coming in from all different communities from all different cultures and backgrounds and they go through Bain al-Harmain and enter at Hazrat Abbas's harem and there there is just non-stop chants of La Baikya Hussain, La Baikya Abbas and it's so loud in your heart and it's so, it's so empowering to know that everyone who is here from different cities or different villages or different tribes or communities, everyone has now gathered in this one place 
uh, obviously getting to the zari and holding on and trying to make your duas at the time of Arbain is very difficult. There are millions of people everywhere trying to get their duas to our imams, to our, to our leaders. And when you actually, so for the women downstairs, I think we use the basement to, um, to complete our ziyarat. And for the women, they had a very organized system, which was, um, it was great for us actually, because they had uh, lanes where people would come in from both sides and it would then finish and you'd have to leave through the middle. So um, it, was, it was easier for the women compared to the men. My cousins, were telling, my, um, my cousins would tell me that, you know, it took them five or six hours to get to touch the zari or to hold on or to try and make their duas. But for, women, for us women, alhamdulillah, when we were in Garbala, it was very easy. Um, the fact that we had access to the basement and there was a massive area as well for us to read namaz so close to the zari. Um, it was like a dream come true. Um, I was, I was able to do that in February when it was off peak and there wasn't much of a crowd, but at Urbain time to be reading so close to the Zari, to be reading right next to where they're buried, uh, that was, a, that was a, a huge blessing. What did I feel at the time of actually being next to them? You kind of question your own character, your own soul, and you think, am I worthy enough of being next to them right now, standing with them, standing, doing my, reciting my namaz. Have I, have I done things correctly up until this point in my life? Many things in the moments when you're standing there reciting your namaz, I know that your namaz should be for your own ibadat, but you kind of get lost in your thoughts while you're reciting and while you're trying to complete your ziyarat. And I think when you complete your first ziyarat, when you complete Urbain, when you com when you come back, and you you know you're now going back into the realities of you know you're at work or you're at university and you're meeting your friends, you're with your family, you're having dinner with everyone, and it's not the same as you sitting in your mokibs and you're having you know your little containers of like lentils and rice, or you're not you know sleeping on these mattresses or not even sleeping on a mattress you're sleeping on the floor because there's not space anywhere or you're you know you, you know when you explain these so stories to your family and friends back home that you went through these struggles it, it it's not a struggle it's yeah i mean at the time it really feels difficult and you're like oh i'm so tired or oh i i wish you know i could get you know some pizza or something <laughs> you know really really silly things um that you kind of, you take for granted, I guess, while you're, while you're thinking about it. For me, going and coming back and being back in uh, London where things are so much more normal for me, I kind of feel like I need to experience those struggles again and see the difficulties out there again, just so that I can learn more, I can develop more, I can, I can hopefully build a a, an even stronger connection to to maybe even a small tiny percentage of what the struggles that our leaders went through. Uh, in Garbala there are many maqams um, to visit, to uh, pay respects to. There's Tila uh, Zainabiya, there's the Khayme, there's Maqami Ali Akbar, Maqami Ali Asghar, um, Sheriff Fizza, there's um, there are so many places to visit and obviously at Urbain time it takes quite a while to visit through all of them because of such massive crowds. Um, this time round, Dilla Zainabia and the campsites were closed for renovations. Um, inshallah, I'm not sure if they'll be open this year for us to visit. I hope they are. Um, but for me at Urbain time, I went to visit Magami Ali Akbar at least three or four times. So in narrations, it said it says that he was 18 years old, and I guess building a uh, establishing a connection to someone that was kind of my age, um, I think that was quite imp that was quite strong for me. Um, but other than that, Hazrat Abbas's Rosa, I think that's where you feel the strongest amount of pain and beauty and pride because you know that someone like him was standing by the side of the grandson of the Prophet. Um, Hazrat Thabas, we know him as the warrior, as the one who had the most might in his sword, the one that had the, mo the most fearless approach to any kind of battle. But what we also, I guess, 
you know, we tend to forget that Hazrat Abbas was also compassionate and empathetic and someone who had so much care in his heart and someone who had so much love in his heart for his, for his niece um, and for his family. And we, we forget that he's not just the warrior and the one that's the most mighty, the mightiest soldier on the battlefield. He's also someone who stands for humanity and his character lives on today in the way that Imam Hussain does, in the way that Imam Ali does, in the way that every single character in the Ahlul Bayt they stood for and they still stand for in our voices. So I think the most special thing for me was that I got to visit Iraq twice in one year. I got to visit our most respected leaders twice in one year. That was, I think, the biggest dream come true, um, biggest blessing for me that I was able to, to complete Ziyarat at an off-peak stage where things were a lot more relaxed, where we could very easily go into the harem within five minutes, we could be inside the harem next to the Zari and complete our namaz and complete our Ziyarat. And then going a few months later at Arbain time, standing in a line for about an hour to give your phone in and to give your shoes in, then to stand in uh, a line for about an hour to get security going through, then to actually get through the harem and going to the basement area. Within all of that, you learn a lot of sabr because there are obviously a lot of pushing and pulling and, you know, I want to go first. Um, but you also, you also learn compassion. You also learn that there are so many people out there that have come for their own different reasons, their own different duas that they want to come true, that they want to see for their children or for themselves or for their parents or for their friends. Um, and it just puts things into perspective that we aren't only living for ourselves, we are living for, our, for this world, for the people around us. We're living for the people that will enter this world as well in, in the future. And ultimately we are living for him up there. We're living for the infallibles that he created for us to aspire to be like. I think Iraq, Garbala, Najaf, Ghazman, Samra, Balad, all of those areas, all of those cities, they speak so individually and so powerfully for themselves, but they all speak for the same concept or for the same idea that we are human and that we really do forget that everyone goes through struggles and everyone's got their own tests in their own different ways. So my final thoughts for my trip, um, to Iraq would be to encourage as many people as possible to go from whichever religious background they are, from whichever cultural background they are from. Going to Ziyarat really makes you see the side of, see a side of humanity that you would never see in any country, I believe. I haven't seen enough of the world, but for me, seeing Garbala and seeing the walk and seeing the way that the people are so humble and so generous and so kind you don't see that kind of behavior in any other part of the world um, so i definitely i mostly encourage you to take your children from a very young age just so that they can see the magnificence around what beautiful leaders we have we have such perfect examples of how to be human of how to be how to aspire towards being a perfect example of what we can show the rest of the world that this is what Shias, this is what Shias are, this is what we have learned from our leaders. And that, that's the most important message for me, I guess, is that Ziyarat has taught me how to be the best kind of human you can be. My reflections and the way that things have changed for me individually, um, since Ziyarat and since Arbain, I feel like um, before Ziyarat and before Arbain, I don't feel like I made enough of an attempt or enough of an effort to understand the wider background of what happened in Garbala, of more stories of what their childhood was or what they grew up with or how their marriages happened or what their children were like or what their cousins were like. I didn't have enough 
background knowledge. I just knew what happened in Gobala, or I just knew how Imam Ali was killed, or I just knew about their martyrdoms. I didn't know about their characters enough. So one thing I came back with, especially after Arab Brain, was that I want to learn more. I want to develop my knowledge. I want to understand more of their characters so that I can understand more of what my character should be as well. So I'm, I, I'm, I, I actually can't wait to go again. And I pray that all of you are a also able to go. <laughs> لبيك يا حسين 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 Let me hear your voice.